I'd like to introduce uh, Joseph South to you. Uh, Joseph is the Deputy Director of the Office of Education Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. And so I'm just going to put down the bio because you guys can read it, but um, I met Joseph last year in Washington. He was on a panel um, presenting at, at a, a conference and, um, and I just was totally smitten and um, Googled him and uh, and he said in his bio that he's an instructional designer. And so I just said, okay, we have to have this guy come to the summit. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Joseph South. Thank you so much, Joseph, for coming. Thank you. Um, how, how are we doing on the mic? Are we good? Yeah. Oh, up a little? A little bit? Should I do Bono? Much better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so it's really great to be here. Um, it's so wonderful to, uh, just that, that, that rooms full of instructional designers exist just makes me happy. Um, I, I know that many of you have the same problem that I have, which is when I try to tell people I'm an instructional designer, nobody has any idea what that means. Um, my, my sister for years just told people that I made websites because that's about as far as she could follow the conversation. Um, I. Um, I'm not currently um, an instructional designer um, in, in the traditional sense, but it's really interesting in my present role how much I draw upon my background in instructional design for the things that we do and, and really the way we go about doing them. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some of what um, the U.S. Department of Education is doing to move innovation along in higher education. Um, usually I'm... I'm, uh, I'm this is sort of an aha moment for my audiences. I don't think this is going to be the same way for this audience. Um, I think you're really, really plugged into these issues. Um, so hopefully you'll um, feel a sense of resonance with, with the things that I say. And, and, I'm, and I am hoping that you do learn something new today. So I think I'm going to ask you at the end whether you learned anything new. And if hands go up, then I'll, I'll be happy. Um, so. If you think about it, um, really the original purpose of higher education was innovation. So really, higher education equals innovation, right? So, so why is there a question mark after that? Um, you know, higher education, as you know, has long-standing traditions. And while the point of view of a PhD is to do something new and original, um, that, that originality doesn't always extend to the institution. And so really, when I talk about innovation in higher education, I feel like what higher education fails to do in many cases is to innovate on the model of higher education itself. And if you think about it, um, you know, our system was based on the um, English system, which was really based on a one-to-one -one tutoring system. And even today, if you um, go to Oxford, the, the tutoring sessions are required and the lectures are optional. And so when we brought that, that model to America, we tried to scale it up, which was very laudable because, of course, that, those opportunities didn't exist in the English system at the time. But when we scaled it up, we made the lectures required and the office hours optional, right? And I don't know how many of you um, have students just scrambling to get a slot in your office hours, or the office hours of your faculty, but that model has flipped. Um, and, and we've lost something really, really important there. And as a result, undergraduate education um, is really secondary. And oftentimes, it's in traditionally been handed off to graduate students so they can make money, so that they can be there for what? To support the graduate study, which is where the one-on-one -on -one tutoring happens. So. What we would like to see is a shift um, in focus to bring that innovation to undergraduate education and put our energy and, and time in there. Um, so why is now the right time to innovate? Um, as usual, innovation happens when there's compelling needs and unprecedented opportunities, and both of those exist in higher education today. So I want to first talk about what the compelling needs are. And again, I think this will be familiar with you. So the number one problem that we have is that students are not finishing. Um, 
if you think about the fact that 40% of students who start don't finish, that's an amazing, amazing number. Um, some estimates are as high as 52%. When you throw in community colleges, more than half don't finish. Now, I heard your chancellor say that your graduation rate was 62%, which is phenomenal in this environment, right? But it's not phenomenal for the 38% the of people who don't graduate. Um, and and what, what really concerns me is we're at the bottom of the world in this statistic. Only Hungary's worse. And if you're, if you're running a race and you look behind you and the only people you see are hungry, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not a good situation to be in. The other thing that we need to think about is the cumulative effect of this. So there are 31 million Americans um, who started but did not finish college over the last 20 years. That's 10% of our population. And an incredible number to think about. And if you look at the last um, 10 years, the price of tuition is up 51%. So has college gotten 51% more awesome in the last 10 years? Are we making 51% more dollars because we went to college now than we did 10 years ago? Um, no, the, the value is not keeping pace. And when you realize that two-thirds of our students are borrowing money to go, I mean, we're really creating a, a perfect storm. Um, so, so if you think about it, there's 10% of our population that have no credential, limited income potential because they didn't finish their degree, large debt um, among people with student loans, there's a, they have a greater rate of default um, in general, and most importantly, their hopes that they've had have been crushed, and they're trying to scrape by with this in this situation. And it's an incredible amount of waste. And if, if you think about these people having gone to college, just the, my analogy is they were going to build a beautiful house that they were going to live in for the rest of their lives. And we know that if you graduate from college, it has an impact of something like a million dollars over your lifetime in income. Um, and what they got is they put down their big, their big construction loan, invested tens of thousands of dollars in some cases, and they got this. It, it's not done. And so they're, they're camping out across the country in these half-finished degrees, trying to figure out how they're going to keep a roof over their heads economically. Um, and it's a, it's a really, really tough situation. You know, in my mind, this crisis, while it's invisible, is just as bad or possibly worse than the housing crisis that, that is so visible. So the second problem is um, that students are simply not ready for college work when they get there. And again, it's something I'm sure you're very, very familiar with, but the numbers, again, are staggering. 60% um, need some form of remediation. And, and even worse, if you start out behind, you stay behind, and a lot of, a lot of times you, you drop out. Um, I have a relative who, um, she was a first-generation college student, um, her parents' working class background. She went, she did excellent in math in high school. She was kind of a whiz. She went to college, had to take college algebra, and they um, put her on, and I, I hate to say it, but they put her on an, an adaptive learning system all by herself in, in a room. She had no support system. She had no friends. She had to pass this class before she could do, quote, unquote, real college, and she just she couldn't do it. She, she dropped out. And I was just talking to her a couple weeks ago and said, have you thought about going back? And she said, well, this time I'm going to save up. I'm not going to go back till I have the money in my pocket because she's still working off the loans from that disastrous semester for her. The third issue is that the degrees aren't always matching up to the desired job or the job skills. Um, I do recognize that a college degree is more than a job. Um, absolutely, there's benefits beyond employment. But, you know, when you open up the box um, of, 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 your, of your iPhone, you hope that there's an iPhone and you really hope that there's a charger. I, I hope that when you open up the box of your college degree, there's a job in there, right, along with whatever other goodies 
you got there, it'd be seems like the job should be in the box. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, that that mismatch then leads to uh, you know another sort of crisis, and this has actually led to I don't know if you've heard um, I won't I won't mention the name of the company, but there's kind of a, a finishing school for liberal arts educators education sorry liberal arts education majors, where after graduating they pay an additional um, five figure number to learn business skills and analytical skills and problem solving skills and budgeting skills so they can actually go and get a job. Um, and you know, just think about that. You know, that, that just does not add up um, the way it should. And, and I just, I think I want to make the additional point that all the stats that I just gave you are far worse for students um, of color. And those tend to be students who make up a large portion of first generation college students. So it's the people who are really trying to take their first steps to a future, not just for themselves, but for their entire family and, and, and generations of family that end up um, at, at these kinds of difficult situations and dead ends. So, and so why is this happening? How did we find ourselves in such a, such a difficult position? Um, and again, this is often a, a, a revelation to the people that I talk to. I don't think it's going to be to you. Um, so here's a, here's a wonderful picture of our um, traditional college students. We invest in houses, housing, and gyms, and commons areas, and food services, and climbing walls, and fancy libraries, so that they are, will be happily ensconced in our uh, institution of higher education. Um, in fact, institutions of higher education are going in debt for all those things. Um, the University of California system has $14.5 billion in outstanding debt. Um, a lot of that um, built in facilities. Um, that's more than double their debt in 2005. Um, so it's not just the students who are in debt, it's the institutions themselves. And, and a portion of that is because they're trying to serve these traditional students. Well, those are not the traditional students of higher education anymore. Um, only 30% of students are full-time and of standard college age. These are the traditional students of higher education. Um, and you, again, I'm sure you're familiar with these stats. You're talking about students who are working full time. Many of them are parents. And half of the ones who are parents are single parents. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm done hearing the term traditional student in this, in this regard. At some point, you just have to walk away. Um, we keep using that word, but I don't think it means what we say that it means. The typical student is now atypical. Um, and so the problem that I see is the audience has changed, but the model has not. And we need to adjust the model to match the student. So how do we do that? Um, I can talk about three ways we need to make higher education more flexible. Um, it needs to be able to work around complicated lives of working, working students and parents. We need to make it more efficient. Um, it needs to take into account what people already know and make sure that they're spending their time, basically the, the minimum necessary time, getting their college education. And we need to make it much, much more affordable. Um, and to just put this in perspective, um, I have to show you one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> so Johnny says this better than I ever could. Um, students don't buy textbooks anymore. Um, two out of three students choose not to buy textbooks because of cost. Um, one in two, that is half, say they have at some point taken fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks. Now think about that. If you take fewer courses because your textbooks are expensive, what are you going to have more of? Mm -hmm. Semesters. Compare the cost of textbooks to the cost of semesters, right? That is not a logical decision that, that is being made, but it's an immediate decision. It, it affects the dollars in your pocket, right? And, and so people are making those decisions. Um, and, you know, as has been pointed out elsewhere, 
Students don't learn from materials they can't afford. Um, so we can't keep going down this path. If, if one course for every higher ed institution in the United States switched over to an open textbook, we would collectively save $1.2 billion. So there's a tremendous area of, of cost savings. It's only one of the areas that, that could be addressed, um, but it's, it's an area that I think there's tremendous potential. Um, and I just want to say one more thing. Well, let me, let me make the point with this. The third area is we need to make higher education more relevant to the workforce. And again, this is something that I think um, people in this room are probably really tuned into. But I, I, this was really driven home for me. Um, I w worked on a project with an elite uh, school of business. And we were working with them to um, possibly do an online uh, degree program for their institution. And these are, the, these are the best, some of the very best and brightest students in the country. And being an instructional designer, before I was going to design anything, I wanted to do a needs analysis. So I talked to the students and I talked to the teachers or the, the professors. And when we talked to the students, I was really shocked. So one, I found out that very few of them buy their textbooks, even though they can afford them. Because they can get that stuff online. And it's faster and it's easier and it's the way they're used to reading it. And they actually can get multiple versions. I, I mean, they, they told me this. They're like, if I don't understand one of them, I go back to Google, I Google it again, I read the next one. Don't understand that, I read the next one. Oh, that's it. That's the explanation I needed. Good, done. Why would I buy a textbook that has a single explanation in it? But I can go to Google and get four or five or six until I find one that actually works for me. But this is the other thing that was completely shocking to me, is they decide which classes to attend. So once again, these are students who they or their parents or their student loans are paying top dollar. They have to decide which classes to attend. And I'm like, why don't you go to class? Like this is, you were paying a lot of money to be there. And they're like, we are too busy. I'm like, too busy doing what? You are not, you're not working to put yourself through college. What are you doing? And they are networking. They're volunteering with businesses that they're interested in being a part of. Um, they are what they described as learning. Um, so what they do is they spend a ton of time working with other startups, sitting on boards, writing business plans, um, working with nonprofits out in the community. They're, they're doing what they know will be relevant to their job. And it's not what's happening in the classroom. So for students who are in that situation, who know what to do and how to trust themselves and to make those decisions, great. For students who are new to this whole world and trust us to provide them exactly what they need in their classroom, it's a catastrophe if that classroom does not match what they actually need. So how do we go about this? Um, there's many, many ways to do it. I'm gonna talk about um, some ways that uh, the federal uh, government um, the U.S. Department of Education is looking at addressing these. So I'll, I'll talk about um, experimental sites, first in the world grants, and online skills academy. So first of all, how many people are familiar with the concept of experimental sites or X sites? Is that a term that's familiar to you? Okay, great. Then you're going to learn something new, which makes me really happy. Um, so this gets back to what Christopher was saying um, when, when people, when the question came about competency-based education, right? So, so to, to actually make fundamental change in the laws that would allow for the massive um, uh, proliferation of competency-based education across the country would, would be a major, major change in legislation. So in the meantime, we have authority from Congress um, that provides um, an exemption for experimental sites. And what this lets us do is it allows us to use, um, to in particular sites that apply for this privilege, you can use student um, Title IV funds in competency-based or prior learning models, right? So in normally, you'd be barred from applying those funds to those models. But in the experimental sites, you can do that. And so we're experimenting with prior learning assessments where you go in and you assess what the person already knows and then give them credit for that so that they can just skip that, 
shortens up the, their, their time in class and moves them forward. And, we are, and we're also experimenting with competency-based education um, where the, you can use federal student loan aid based on, in a self-paced self competency-based program. So th this is a really important concept, um, and I just want to spend a little a minute or two on it. So, so the big difference here is it's learning versus seat time. Um, in a competency-based model, as you probably know, the competencies are outlined. They're usually worked out by working with the uh, potential employers or, or the job or the role that the person wants to have. Those are very carefully analyzed. It's very much an instructional design process. Those competencies are then mapped to skills, and that's all done in a very careful way. And then those are mapped to assessments, um, which are competency-based assessments. You actually have to demonstrate that you know how to do something. Then the students come into the program, if they feel like they, um, they're ready, they can take those assessments right away. They pass the assessments, they're done, that's it. They don't have to sit in class, they don't have to do any more assignments around that particular competency. They can move on. And as a result, learning is getting measured rather than seat time. Um, and the, the people who advocate for competency-based education say that if you are measuring seat time, you're measuring the wrong end of the student. Um, so what this means writ large is this is the beginning of the end of the, end of the Carnegie unit. Um, it's not going to happen immediately, but it will happen. Um, and I don't know, is, is, is anybody here, anybody know the history of the Carnegie unit? Oh yeah, some people do. It's really fun history, isn't it? So um, was, was the Carnegie unit ever intended to measure learning? No. <laughs> Does the Carnegie Foundation claim that it measures learning? No. no. It measures seat time. Um, and and they, the, the Carnegie Foundation just reviewed um, the Carnegie unit themselves. And it was a really interesting report. Um, I don't think the headline's fully captured. I'd actually recommend that you read the report itself. But they basically said, they said a couple of things. They said, we're not ready to let go of the Carnegie unit. It's not really doing what it was supposed to do. Of course, it wasn't really supposed to do what it's being used for, so that's kind of not a fail. Um, and mostly, there's not a better measure of quality. So I don't know what we do instead, um, which I thought was a really interesting analysis. Um, but the point is that we need measures of quality, measures of quality of learning. We need to shift our whole system to focus on those and to be built up from those. And the Carnegie unit is not going to provide that basis. So let me talk about some of the grants that the department um, has put together to spur innovation. So the first one I'll talk about is called the First in the World Grants. Last year, um, there were $75 million in grants went out um, to institutions of higher education. This year, $60 million is up for grabs. So I, I'm putting you on notice. The, the U.S. Department of Education is going to spend $60 million on some institution of higher education around the country that apply and receive the First in the World grants. This could be your institution. Um, the focus broadly is to improve outcomes, make college more affordable, and develop an evidence base of effective practices. But I think what you'll find really interesting is if you look at the proposed priority for this year, so, so the way this works is the grant program persists from year to year broadly, but each year new priorities are proposed for that grant program. And then those applications that meet those, priori pri those priorities have a better chance of being funded than ones that don't. So just um, less than a week ago, we published our proposed priorities for this coming round first in the world. And this is what those priorities are proposed to be. Now we're in a public comment period where, where you <coughs> or anyone can comment on these, which could adjust the priorities or even change them. Generally speaking, um, you know, maybe one priority might change as a result of that process. Most of them remain. <coughs> Oops. I missed the computer. That's all that matters. Um, <coughs> So this is very likely where, where that money is going to go. 
you may see on this list things that you care very deeply about, things that you are currently experimenting with and innovating around in your institution. And if so, I would highly encourage you to apply for one of these grants. Um, the grant solicitation will probably come out later on this spring, um, so keep your eye out for that. Um, <coughs> these are some of the winners of the first round, just so that you have an idea. And is there anybody from SUNY Oswego here? Yeah, you guys are winners. Do you, are, are you directly involved in that grant work? No? Yes. You could be. So, <laughs> so um, their grant, um, if I, I read it through last night, is around retention, right? And, and there's several strategies that they're using in the face-to-face -face part of the institution um, to increase retention among students. So next year, or this year, I think you all should do the same thing for the online portion, right? Certainly apply. To give you a sense of what some of these are like, I just pulled a few from last year's winners. Um, Arizona State University is doing really interesting stuff with project-based majors. And one of the interesting things they're doing is <coughs> the projects actually start with the senior year of students in high school. And they cross over the summer and they work all summer on, on their first project. And they finish it in the first few weeks of their undergraduate, of their first undergraduate year of college. So in addition to taking a really innovative approach to make a project-based major, they're actually using that same methodology to bridge students from high school to higher education. Um, at Bay Path Community, or Bay Path College, excuse me, they're using learning analytics <coughs> and really creating a social infrastructure to help um, it's, a, it's a women's college um, to help them persist um, in an online experience there. So that's definitely a model worth looking at. Um, Georgia Tech is trying to make sure students with disabilities um, have, a, have access to their online resources. Um, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, as you know. Um, as we go more digital, we need to make sure that, that we're increasing access. You know, it's, it's a little ironic. We're increasing. We go digital to increase access, but we don't always increase access for the people who need it the most. Um, so they're trying to work on that. And then you're probably aware of Southern New Hampshire University. I noticed your chancellor mentioned them. Um, the, the thing that they're doing here, um, you know, the statistic I gave that one in four students who start in remediation, um, what we call developmental ed, don't finish. They're trying to eliminate that. And their strategy is, let's start them in the actual course there will be no stigma atta attached. There will be no isolation from other students. But as they go along, as they hit those issues, we'll remediate them in, in seek to, as it were. So right, right, in, in, right away in the process of, um, which is a really interesting idea. And it, that requires a really different course design. And that's what they're using the grant money um, on. So, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the Online Skills Academy. I'm really excited about this. I've, I've been spending a lot of time on this one. So the Labor Department has $25 million um, of grant money available. And it's, we're collaborating with them, um, Department of Education and the White House. And the idea is, is to provide pathways um, to help upskill Americans. So there's been a recent study that there's 36 million Americans who are what are considered to be low skilled. This means that they struggle with basic um, literacy or nu numeracy. 36 million Americans. Um, two thirds of them are working, the other third are not. And if they're going to enter the middle class, they need a pathway out of that situation. The idea is is to provide a, and, and, and so I should say at this point, none of this is set in stone. So everything I, I'm telling you is speculative. Um, but right now, this is conceived as an open competency-based platform that would support the development of these pathways that would lead to upskills. Um, ideally, and I guess partly, I, whenever I say ideal, I, what I'm really saying is, and I think, um, so, and I think that the competencies themselves should be open, um, that the 
OER will probably be the, the focus of the materials that are being developed. We're also hoping to make open competency-based assessments. And then the idea is that that core would be open and free to the student. <clears throat> and then there could be wraparound services that would be paid for, but hopefully at a discounted price. So the, a credential from a community college, for example, might be wrapped around those services and there might be a charge for that, or counseling, or um, tutoring, or other kinds of support. Um, so um, I'm really excited about the potential that this has to um, show a model that could be replicated in community colleges across the country. And by making it open, we're hoping to make that really easy. In fact, one of the goals would be to just make it so that a community college who doesn't have a competency-based program could just copy and paste this into their, into their model, um, personalize it for their institution, and use it as a starting point. Um, and then one I, I do need to mention is America's College Promise. I'm sure this is something you've heard of. Um, this is the president's vision to provide free community college um, throughout, across the country. Um, and I don't know if you know, I'll just mention a few of the details because they're, they're very rarely repeated in, in any of the headlines. Um, in order to qualify, a student would need to attend a, at least half time, uh, maintain a GPA of, of a 2.5 GPA, and be making steady progress towards completing the program. Um, community colleges um, <clears throat> would need to make sure that the, they, they have strong relationships with four-year colleges so that, that that credit is transferred, as well as that they are focused on uh, degree programs that lead directly to jobs so that when the student completes, they either transfer to a four-year or um, get a, um, a high-demand job. Um, federal funding would cover three-quarters of the average cost of the community college, and then the state would be expected um, to, to make up the rest of that. Um, and so this is, of course, the President's proposal. Um, it, Congress is, would, would have to decide that it was a good idea and pass it, and its, its future is unknown at this point. So to summarize, um, you know, the levers of innovation that we have available to us that we're working on um, is, of course, policy. And I think one of the policy areas that we're most concerned about is what I would describe the liquidity of credit. So these um, half-finished degrees, part of the problem is, is that those credits are locked into the institution that the person came from. And it's very hard to transfer that credit to another institution. Um, and in general, it's very difficult to transfer credit. And I remember when I was a student, I had somebody transfer in from, frankly, a more prestigious school than the one I was going to. And I think like 20% of their credits transferred, um, which is just astonishing. Um, and so this is something that uh, the Undersecretary Ted Mitchell was very, very concerned about and would like to see um, changed in higher education. And, and there's um, ideas that are percolating of how that, that might happen. Another policy issue, of course, is <coughs> what quali- <coughs> what, excuse me. is what qualifies as credit, and that gets back to the seat time versus competencies. And then, um, I, I'm sorry, competencies versus um, courses, and then how is credit calculated, which gets back to those models, the competency models. Um, I think the second one that, that the department's really concerned about is alignment. And this is a huge issue, the alignment between high school to post-secondary education to workforce. And, and we feel like there are significant gaps there. Um, if our high schools aren't preparing our students to be in college, then there's a gap. And then if our higher ed ed institution is not preparing our students to enter the workforce, there's a gap. And there's a lot of things that can be done here. You know, one, one is data sharing. There's actually um, places around the country where high schools and, and post-secondary institutions share data back and forth so that they actually know how they're doing. Um, there's so many, there's so many times, so many high schools are when the, when the kid graduates, that's like the end, they, they no longer exist until they come back for their five year reunion. And they're trying to end that gap and, and bridge that data across so that you can understand how am I doing? How, how, are, how are my students received when they get to higher education? And bridging that as well. 
Um, and then the last one is, of course, new models. And this is the, thank you. <laughs> and this is some of what I talked about around competency-based learning or prior assessment um, or online models, um, which is you know, still considered new, even though it's been around for quite a while. So, um, so how can you engage this process? So one, um, I really encourage you to take a look at those First in the World grantees and see what they're doing. I think you'll find really interesting ideas there and people to talk to. Um, you can pick up the phone and call them and ask what they're doing and how they're doing them and see um, how they might transfer to your institution. Second, I would encourage you to look for the second round of First in the World grants. Um, the only stipulation is that it's the grantee must be an institute of higher education. And so since you're all um, part of the Institute of Higher Education, you could qualify. Um, I also encourage you to look for the Online Skills um, Academy solicitation. We anticipate that that grant money will go not to a single entity, but to a consortium. And in that consortium, we imagine community colleges, um, four-year institutions, technology partners, um, employment partners. Um, we, th we think that will be a coalition. and you have those kinds of relationships where you are in, in this state and I could imagine you being able to put together a very, very strong uh, coalition to be a part of that. And we hope that comes out um, later on this year. And then, <coughs> and then the last thing I would say is I just encourage you to, you know, think about these students. Think about, and, and I know, again, in this audience, I know you do, think about the pressures that they have. Think about the distractions that they have, think about what they're up against, think about the fact that they're trying to change the way their family has done things for generations just by being in college. And, you know, if you succeed, they succeed. And if you fail, they fail. You are on the front lines of the solution to these, to these issues. And the more that you can engage that and let people know who aren't in this room that this is the situation and how serious it is and what you need to solve it, the better. Um, and I just encourage you to start a conversation, you know, right now. Um, if you can think of somebody um, who doesn't know what we discussed today, who should know about it, send them an email right now. Make a little note in your planner on your iPad and send them a tweet. Make a plan to have a conversation about something that you heard today. And then lastly, um, I just want to say, <coughs> In some ways, I feel like online education is the, is the Pixar of the movie industry. So, you know, back in 1986, this little company called Pixar made this short film about a little lamp that played with a, played with a little ball. Um, you might be familiar with that. Um, people did not take them very seriously. If you think about it, they were entirely digital, and film was entirely not digital. Uh, they were new. They required a retooling of how movies were made, top to bottom, and they were considered sort of a novelty. Um, now, um, years and years later, Toy Story 3 made a billion dollars. Um, nobody thinks of Pixar as a funny little side experiment that we're just trying out to see what might happen for people who aren't really wanting to see a real movie. Um, so I'll let you draw your own analogies between what I just described and face-to-face -face instruction versus online instruction. Um, but my point is that you may feel like this is you, but really, this is you. <laughs> so go get them. Thank you. So much, Joseph. I'm Coming around for questions. Hi, and, and thank you so much. I, I got a lot of value out of that. Um, I, I wanted to kind of go back to something that, that kind of struck me at the beginning of the talk. Um, you know, I, I absolutely agree that the options for, for students um, at all stages of life, in all kinds of situations, are uh, are so incredibly critical, and online, especially fully online, is part of that. But you know, um, 
I see some of the marketing of uh, fully online coursework and degrees um, is being kind of kind of problematic in some ways. Even though it doesn't come oftentimes from our public institutions, it comes from somewhere and it kind of bleeds over into the perception. And I think the marketing oftentimes really does imply this means easy, this means quick. And then that gets turned into, okay, this is something I do after work, <laughs> after my kids, after my house, after every other thing. And there is a point at which, when you're trying to accomplish what our students are in their education, there's, there's effort and there's time that goes in. And I think then we get into a situation where it kind of looks like faculty are pushing back because maybe they're traditional or whatever, but um, maybe that's really what's oftentimes going on as an unexpressed concern is, you know, are students going to be, are we going to be eliciting the effort that gets students to succeed? So how do we reconcile those things? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really thoughtful comment. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and I agree that the, the marketing does not help the cause. Um, and, and if you think about it, you know, in, a lot of, in many ways these students have to work harder, period, in college, whether face-to-face -face or online, because a lot of them come from backgrounds where they don't have the social capital and the resources that sort of tell you this is how you go to college, this is how you're successful, right? So they're coming at a disadvantage. Um, so I don't know what to do about the marketing problem. Um, it is a problem. The, the one thing that comes to mind is, you know, I, I had the chance to visit the Open University um, in the UK. And one of the things that they do is in that first year um, when a student starts, and you're probably aware that Open University, they'll enroll anyone at any time. You don't have to have any background or qualifications. And for a long time, the way you got your lectures is you know the BBC is a state owned and so it, and it runs day and night so the lectures would run from like 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. and people would set their VCRs to record the lecture and then they'd watch it later that's how they did their distance education which is why people in England actually know how to work their VCRs <laughs> and, and people in America don't um, so anyway the point is that they would assign a counselor for that first year and that person's sole job was to help this person make this very difficult transition to going to school while raising kids, while going to work. Help them understand how to study, where to study, when to study. Um, help motivate them to get through the stuff that was hard. Help them find um, study groups that were local to them so that they had somebody to do this with. And we've seen similar, similar effects of doing that with online students. So, so sometimes we're so focused on what they're learning and how they're learning it, we forget that they're making a massive personal and social transition that they're completely unprepared for. And by intensively um, providing counseling um, in that first year, um, once they cross that transition, they do much better in subsequent years. So that's one thing I think we can do and think about that in terms of our model. Um, for me, I'm just I'm going to make a comment. What I see um, often is um, oh, someone go. coming into a community college and after a year um, getting a job that they do want and then leaving. They're not graduating, but they now have a job that they want. We don't count that, but we see that very often with um, returning adult students. That's really interesting. And I, <clears throat> honestly, I, I haven't heard that before. I, I, wish, I wish somebody was counting. I'd love to know how many students end up in that situation. All right, we all done? Great, oh, oh, one more. Any other questions for Joseph? Ah, oh, good, here. excellent. Is the information on those schools that receive the grants, is that on your website or on the websites of those schools or where we could find out more of the details? Yeah, so, so we have, um, let's see, I'm in public so I have to be careful with my description. The Department of Education has a website where you can find that stuff if you are diligent. <laughs> Um, it's, if, you, if you Google um, U.S. Department of Education first in the world, or I think it even comes up if you go the acronym F-I-T-W, um, 
it should pop up and, and what you're looking for is the list of abstracts um, and those are pulled straight from the grant solicitation um, and then you can read through the abstracts to get a sense. There's been a few articles written on it as well so just googling first in the world you might actually get easier to digest stuff just looking at some news articles. Actually I'll go back to that. If you uh, have a camera I'll just leave it there for a minute for people who want to snap a picture that could also be a way to get started on your journey. Any other questions for Joseph? So one question for you. Did you learn something new? Yeah. Yes. 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 Great. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Okay, so um, I, uh, we're going to have a little bit of transition while we get Marshall Hill um, set up at the podium. Uh, no break, we're just going to um, move right along.